Hi everyone, thank you for having me today. Thank you Lorenzo, Loren, for organizing this amazing um, conference and everyone else at the ILO RTA project. Um, so, my name is Charlene Sempere. I'm a PhD student at uh, the University of Sheffield and today I'll present the project upon which the ILO report I wrote is based on and which is itself part of my PhD project. I'll share the screen. The project aimed to explore the vulnerability of women um, workers to forced labor within a former industry in a European context where the presence and experiences of often exploited workers is under researched. Uh, France is one of those places and although it's known for its strong labor standards, um, scandals of modern slavery have have uh, recently made the headlines in the local and national press. And so the research took place uh, between October 2021 and June 2022. I'm still uh, in the field at the moment. Um, and so, yeah, my approach was qualitative, so quite different from uh, Samuel's work, for example, and involved field work and um, uh, in-depth interviews, as well as uh, participatory and observation. Um, so I started by mapping supply chains and conducted preliminary, pre preliminary set of interviews with informants directly involved in within the local uh, agricultural sectors. Um, so such as retail buyers, business managers, labor agencies, recruiters, auditors, uh, and certifiers. And following that stage, I started to conduct interviews with migrant workers themselves. And uh, in order to access migrant workers, vulnerable migrant workers, I, um, I was directly engaged with field associations, volunteering um, and uh, providing some legal and social assistance to workers. Um, I also conducted ethnographies with labor inspectors, uh, visited farms, and observed uh, police professionals and social workers during their, uh, in the workplace when they were dealing with uh, migrant farm workers. Um, and finally also conducted interviews with professionals who provide social and legal assistance to workers, so migrant defenders, trade unions, lawyers, labor inspectors and social workers. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention before I start, um, uh, presenting my results is that um, I've adopted an extended version of the definition of forced labor. My approach is inspired by uh, the work of critical labor researchers who understand forced labor as an extreme case of exploitation located within a spectrum of labor relations uh, ranging from slavery-like conditions to what is commonly considered as free and stable employment. And this extended definition allowed me to uh, take into consideration the different social re uh, relations factors, as well as structural, structural ones that shape workers' freedom on the labor market. Uh, and that included economic coercion and threat of starvation. There are a multitude of structural factors that uh, cultural, social, economic, political, and legal that may explain an individual's position on this continuum in addition to individual ones like moments of penalty and criminality. However, I made the effort in the report to distinguish between milder forms of labor exploitation and situations of forced labor using the ILO forced labor indicators. So to cut short, uh, migrant farm workers and workers who are vulnerable to exploitation are recruited and are integrated into the local agricultural sector um, here in southern France in a very specific context which uh, shapes and increases their freedom. The fresh fruit and vegetable market in France and in Europe, to be honest, is very much buyer-driven. Large retail and distribution companies, given their market share, have a dominant position in the supply chain and that position allows them to dictate price standards, conduct erratic purchasing practices, capture a disproportionate disproportionate share of profits created. And so farmers struggle to make a margin, which does not mean that they don't make a margin, but it means that they have to put a lot of strategies to be able to capture that margin. And 
the creation of wealth along the supply chain is very unequally shared. And to stay afloat, what I found is that farmers have different strategies, notably to produce on a large industrial scale uh, so that buyers are interested. Um, they cut intermediaries, they produce organic, but what came out from the interviews is that um, most business had also put in place labor sourcing and labor management strategies as a way to optimize production costs, stay competitive on price, face the industrial scale of crop production and render the business more flexible uh, um, in a rather unpredictable market. And this strategy implied outsourcing recruitment to recruiting agents such as temporary work agencies using the posted worker EU directive or recruiting migrant workers directly via labor migration program or under a short term contract for specific low paid, flexible and short term precarious roles, which could be subordinated to production needs and timing, but with very little consideration for the viability of those worker arrangements for workers. Um, you can see on the slide the different avenue that employers take to recruit seasonal migrant workers. I've decided to focus on the um, labor migration program that is run by the state and the um, role of uh, staffing agencies, EU temporary work agencies, because those avenues were the one that I've um, noticed can lead to severe form of labor exploitation. Um, each of these recruitment avenues have different advantages. Um, outsourcing recruitment and management of workers uh, via uh, European temporary work agencies or recruiting via the office state-run labor migration program enable workers to access a large pool of qualified, flexible and cheap workers who, give, who given the way they are recruited are either at the disposal, at the disposal sorry, of the farmer's need or in case of the OFI workers, the ones coming from, through the labor program, um, they are completely tied, their legal status and their right to, to stay in France is completely tied to their employees. Um, the, ac the accommodation and the workloads uh, are also dependent upon the employer or recruiter. These forms of employment of foreign born uh, workers provide farmers with a capacity to select workers as well. Um, and one farmer clearly explained to me that he consciously selected only migrant and very precarious ones because he believed they were going to be more hardworking, more reliable and more docile because they were so desperate for the work. Um, overall, those labor recruiting uh, methods give disproportionate powers to employers and recruiters over the workers' income, their legal status and their accommodation once in France, which constitute an open door to illegal and abusive practices. Um, I have found that migrant workers occupy the most unstable, physically demanding and lowest paid position in the agricultural industry in Southern France. As you can see on the diagram, um, when, when all goes well, when they have a legal contract and when the terms are being respected, it's already quite a rather precarious position to be in because um, their income cannot guarantee, uh, th th this work cannot guarantee an income all year round. And um, sorry, in addition to that, I've found that being part of a socially disprivileged social category, for example, identifying as a woman, uh, increased vulnerability to various forms of exploitation quite significantly and for various reasons. Um, workers are selected ba based on their gender, their origins, their physical traits, and based on their precarity. And women, irregular migrants, and racialized workers are found at the bottom of the farm hierarchy and are mostly being overseen by men, French, and EU nationals. Given the segregation and the discrimination practiced in the industry, identifying as a woman, as I said earlier, significantly aggravated the already unbalanced power relations between employees and recruiters and workers. Um, I've found that women face additional pressures and constraints. They have to overcome more barriers and discrimination and are exposed to multifaceted violence and abuse within the industry, uh, given their disprivileged dis position in the household and in the industry. Most women interviewees had um, migrated to France to work um, 
and as a way to escape patriarchal norms, um, that's their words, they use that word to me during interviews, and to escape domestic violence, and as a way to invest in their children's, children's future. The majority of them were single and, most, and um, in charge of several children. Family responsibilities and domestic work is mostly upheld by them and consi constitute a strong time constraint and a significant additional economic pressure, which in turn become an incentive to accept bad treatment in order to maintain an income. Um, given their migration status, the opportunities available are poorly paid and very demanding physically and time-wise. In addition to that, farmers and recruiters do not hesitate to remind workers of their inter interchangeability and that women cannot perform physical work requir required in farm work, which together works again as a strong incentive for women workers to do as much as possible to keep one employment when they have one. And despite this cliche, that women cannot perform farm work, employers clearly express to me appreciating employing women and because they believe they work faster, they think ahead, they are more agile and docile. But while those, those skills seem to be appreciated, uh, they are not source of a fin financial recognition or work promotion out of the seasonal low paid position. And once, once in employment, women also become exposed to a unique set of discriminations and power relation given their disprivileged uh, social position as women, mothers, victims of domestic violence and racialized worker. Women interviewees evoked being discriminated against and having to constantly prove their worth in, in farm work, being subjected to racial and gender injustices, uh, sexual harassment and abuses, blackmailing from male colleagues, male supervisors, managers, recruiters, employers, and sometimes even from the husband, who given their overall dominant position in the industry offer women workers in exchange, safety, better pay, better work, more free time and better accommodation. And the abusive employees and recruiters uh, and middlemen did not need to exercise any physical force, even though it did happen, uh, but sexual exploitation and labor exploitation was a possible effect of an overall exploitative context and a male dominated industry in which women felt they had few other possibilities to um, make a living for themselves and their families. And in such situation, many women admitted to keep it silent, not rebelling, working as many hours as possible, accepting over time when they could, then accepting dangerous working conditions and demands of higher work intensity uh, to keep their work, to earn as much money and to guarantee their autonomy and safety and the uh, ones of their children. Um, and to protect themselves from sexual abuse in workplace and in collective work accommodation. Um, some women decided to uh, pair up with friends, with male colleagues, or to leave the collective uh, housing accommodation that they were provided by the recruiter and sleeping rough. Some decided to denounce their abuse, but as a result were penalized financially and were wrongly accused of having instigated the situation of abuse, which further incentivized other women to keep silent um, if they wanted to keep their position. And abusive and exploitative conditions took many forms and could ex escalate to a situation of freedom where workers had a certain trajectory. That is when they had been recruited via, via intermediaries, such as through European temporary work agencies, service suppliers, or irregular intermediaries of the other labor migration program, and also when workers were reliant on their employer or recruiter for accommodation. As these schemes put them in position of strong dependency and constant instability, and also because employers and recruiters uh, continue to be shielded from liability, liability uh, for various reasons which I cannot detail here. And these trajectories were uh, addition to specific gender vulnerabilities um, that I've just mentioned could lead to situations of forced labor. And so understanding how this gender power relation, the overall oppressive context in which migrants uh, evolve um, is, and the additional constraint with economic compulsions of poverty compound to a unique pattern of vulnerability and exposure is extremely important to effectively tackle 
uh, forced labor of women in the global economy. Find me. Uh, so forced labor took different forms and constituted of a combination of several abuse. Um, the vulnerability of migrant workers situation is constantly abused. Uh, it may be because they currently have, don't have the right to work in France or they are waiting for their residency title, for example. They don't speak French, they don't know their rights in France, they are illiterate or simply desperate for money or completely as isolated or they don't, they don't know what other options they have uh, in terms of work. And this abuse of vulnerability often led to deception. Most workers that came through the labor migration program and the uh, workers working with uh, recruiters told me that they were deceived uh, regarding the regularity of their contract payment of social contributions regarding work hours and uh, salary wages. Most workers encountered for the study experienced abusive working and living conditions as well as excessive working hours. Um, workers work, work way above the 48 hours limit of the normal working week in difficult and hazardous condition. The majority of workers explain working six days a week and sometimes Sundays too for more than 10 hours a day. Um, most workers received the wage that were, that were or are not proportional to hours worked. Payment seems in many cases totally arbitrary and on many occasions when the French minimum wage notably due to um, non-payment of overtime and due to illegal charges that were deducted of their wage. Workers had experienced denial of maternity leave, denial of recognition of a work accident or unfair dismissal. They complained about pains and disease due to having worked with pesticides or next to chemicals unprotected. Most mentioned several restrictive working rules such as no eating, no drinking, no chatting, no mobile phone, and no toilet breaks during work hours. In numerous cases, workers reported being blackmailed and threatened of denunciation to immigration authorities, dismissal, wage withholding, false denunciation for frauding French social services being sent by recruiters to farms which are known for particularly bad working condition as a punishment. Um, workers were subjected to harassment, physical abuses, and sexual abuses from hierarchies on farms and from staffing agencies, as well as from male colleagues in, in the case of women, both on work sites and accommodations. Among women interviewees, five women accepted to talk about sexual abuse they had been subjected to. However, all women interviewees mentioned that sexual harassment, abuse, and blackmail is very common in the industry, but still very much stigmatized. Workers who rebelled were exposed to retribution in the form of dismissal, wage theft, and physical violence. Finally, uh, Caroline, sorry, uh, we have three, mi three minutes to go. Okay, left. I'm Thank nearly done. Thank you. Uh, finally, many of the workers and posted workers complain about the inhuman state of their accommodation, overcrowded, inadequate, substandard, if not rudimentary, where privacy was not possible and water and sanitation facilities not functioning. Women also clearly explain that accommodation provided by recruiters and, and, and employers uh, was con constantly used as leverage to sexually blackmail women. And Workers who were reliant on their, on their employer or recruiter for their accommodation experienced multiple mobility restrictions, such as curfew hours, total prevention uh, from leaving the accommodation or the work site, no rights to own a car, not allowed to go shopping by themselves and whenever they want to, um, interdictions to speak to locals. Um, and most workers who were housed by their employer were significantly uh, isolated living in remote and unpopulated rural areas and or gated campsites. The isolation was compounded by all the rules surrounding the accommodation and working conditions that I've just mentioned. And overall, many workers expressed feelings, uh, feeling degraded by the state of the accommodations and the treatment they were subjected to during their work in France. And the last little bit I wanted to share with you is that that, that bondage was also a thing, although um, it was not systematic. Um, I've met several workers during field work who had experienced that bondage because of illegal uh, migration and employment fees, 
but one, only one of those workers accepted to be interviewed. Uh, undocumented workers and workers reliant on their work permits to obtain a legal status, like workers coming through the labor migration program, often have to pay for their contract or a, recru a recruitment fee to a middleman in advance of migrating or through wage advances. And in those cases, in those cases, they do work in conditions of debt bondage, but because of their very precarious status, they, they didn't want to share that with me. So here are the different uh, components of forced labor that I could observe here. I'm sorry, I couldn't uh, describe in detail all of the things I've written in my report, but hopefully um, this was still interesting. And thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Charlene. Thank you very much for your presentation and all these well, interviews and, and, and the work you, you have done. So let's open for the questions. Is there any question? If not, I'll take the opportunity to raise questions. Okay. So Charlene, uh, you interviewed 25 people, right? Uh, can you tell briefly what the profile are? Uh, how many women, what men, age, where they coming from, if you, if it, and then if you see any pattern related to where they are coming from and, and who suffers more violence or not. Okay, so I have interviewed 25 workers so far, uh, but I've also uh, been able to meet hundreds of them during field work, to be honest. And I've accompanied several of them as well, um, um, filing complaints with the police, um, working with the social security. And so I've had this, although the sample of interviews is quite small, I've had um, an opportunity to observe many more situations. And so workers here come from, mainly from Latin America, uh, Latin American countries uh, who, who then workers come, normally travel through Spain, stay in Spain for a while, and then travel to France uh, to find work, better work. And then the other population here is uh, European workers, so um, Romanian and um, Polish workers working through um, European uh, temporary agencies as well. Um, and then finally, Moroccan and Sub-Saharan uh, workers who also come through uh, temporary work agencies through Spain or through the labor migration uh, program run by the state. And so they were of all ages, to be honest. Um, I was surprised by how, how old some of them were, like in their 60s, 70s, 50s, 60s, 70s. But there's also, um, more recently, there's more younger generations coming. So in the 20s and 30s, uh, people had a secondary uh, education level and many had worked in farm work before. Um, many of them also had other jobs um, in their home country, but had decided to migrate for economic reasons and family reasons. Um, in terms of like how ethnicity played a role uh, in shaping the vulnerability, um, it played a role when there was loads of racial discrimination in the farms and within the recruiting agency. Um, but I didn't, I didn't notice a clear difference between um, ethnicities. It was more the trajectories that sort of um, conditioned the vulnerability to forced labor. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question, but- Yeah, um, perfect, more, more than that. There is one question here in the chat by Rosa Marta. Uh, she asks, did your methodology include a survey on the target people? Uh, my methodology did not include a survey. Um, basically, I had a time limit. I had nine months to conduct that study to access workers that are very isolated, vulnerable, and are actively trying not to be found. Um, so I've spent my time 
um, coming to the field, building networks, accessing workers in an ethical and respect respectable ways. And because of all of those ethical and logistical reasons, I've decided to do a qualitative study. So to explore the experiences of workers through interviews, observations, um, and that did not include a survey because um, even institutions here and social workers here do not have that access. It's very, very difficult. People do not want to be found and are terrified of speaking of their working conditions and of their migration, um, um, their trajectories to France. So the only way I have found to access those uh, testimonies and those stories was to spend a lot of time with them, talk to them, and not through uh, quantitative um, research methods. I also am not qualified for that. I'm more, quali I'm more of a qualitative researcher. Okay. Thank you, Charlene. Uh, congrats for your work. <laughs>